What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Rap and Wrestle podcast. I'm Derek. You should know me. Follow me at Derek T. Gamble on Instagram, Twitter, Rap and Wrestle at Instagram and Twitter as well. Today, I have a very special guest, my boy Joe Kim Morales from Battle Club Pro. Bro, how are you doing, man? What's up, Derek? Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm well, you know, the weather today was a little nuts. Got Time got away from me. That's why I'm doing this from the car instead of the nice setup I usually do, but I didn't want to keep you waiting. Nah, it's all good. It's all good, man. Yeah, that weather, it was pretty nuts, but now it's like a whole turnaround. It's right. beautiful it's out beautiful there right now. It's, crazy. now. it's like, it's like it, the wind was blowing so hard and my air conditioner was whistling. So oh, Yeah, see, it was nuts. It was nuts. It was nuts. And now it's gorgeous, like nothing ever happened. Yeah, man, what can you do? All you can do is improvise like we're doing right now, man. Exactly. That's business. That's business. So, um, you know, for, for my fans who don't know you, um, uh, we talked before on the Wrestling IQ 101 podcast. You was all with me and my boy, Andrew. Um, that was a great interview that we had with you. Um, just tell them, you know, uh, what Battle Club is, uh, Battle Club Pro, and, um, you know, how you got started with that. Yeah, Battle Club Pro is a, it's an all-inclusive professional wrestling, independent professional wrestling company. Uh, I run it with my ownership team, uh, Ray Red, Mike Sabs, um, Elijah Thomas, and Rick uh, Charrieres. Uh, basically, you know, just showcasing pro wrestling through what I've seen growing up. So a lot of minorities, a lot of, uh, you know, LGBTQIA community, um, hardworking people, people that have come in from the ground up that didn't necessarily have a big head start. Um, you know, DIY, ma and pop, like all the cliche lingo you can use. But, you know, we do it ourselves. We do it because we love it. We do it because we want everyone who may not necessarily get a chance to shine to shine. And the, the whole goal is to have people that are on our shows eventually get to TV, get to those huge contracts so that their family is set going forward. Um, I got in. Originally, I was just a commentator. Um the founder, Carlos Aristi, you know, wanted, he wanted to put me on the broadcast team. I told him I wanted more. And we worked together side by side. I've been down since day one. And eventually he just kind of handed, handed it over to me because he saw the dedication that I had. He knew he could trust me with it. And, um, you know, he went on to have, I think he's on like kid number three, but he's aiming for four or five. Oh man! So yeah, yeah, yeah. He's trying to raise a little army over there, uh, and I, you know, God bless him. I love him. Tell him all the time, thank you for the good, the bad, the ugly, the headaches, you know, the pride, everything that could co possibly come with running a wrestling company. I always thank him for it because I wouldn't be anywhere. This wouldn't be happening without him. So I let him know as much as I can. You know, I'm thankful for everything. Yeah, that's that's pretty dope, man. To um, you know, kind of just cross the line, and then now it's like you you're running everything, man. That's that's yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, it's been it's been kind of like difficult times for all of us right now, and um, you know, just having to find different creativeness with um, you know, COVID and everything is that has happened with that. Um, you know, what kind of were some of the challenges now that you know you guys are are having I know um, a lot of people they're kind of like reopening they're doing outdoor shows and stuff at least here down in uh, Jersey um what are some of those challenges that have you guys ventured with you know some of those ideas well you know we we ran two outdoor shows last year so we weren't strangers to outdoor shows we've been trying to run outdoor shows since 2017 we also wanted to you know along with being inclusive we also wanted to stay in the same tone of who we are so whenever we did run in jersey we tried to do what we could to stand out and be different that venue is used quite often by a lot of people um that knights of columbus venue right there on bergen yeah. um so we were, when we wanted to do an outdoor show we wanted to make sure it kind of fit our theme so the venue we have for outdoors is great right now i think uh new york is still prohibiting gatherings of 25 or more and I think if it's for a, like a protest, it's a, a hundred is allowed, but it's got to be under protest. Um, the New York State Athletic Commission, they're being boneheads when it comes to licensing and stuff, because we still don't know the nature of the beast. Like we've got tons of information, but it's still in its novel stage. 
Uh, there's yeah. no vaccination. There's, there's, you know, so many attempts uh, to find some kind of treatment. So the world is opening up slowly, but it doesn't seem to be going away, especially in America. Yeah. So right now we're okay with being on pause because we don't want to run anyone's health, uh, risk anyone's well-being. Um, there are companies that are going and then, you know, good for them. Uh, if they figure out a way to do it appropriately, if they follow the state and government's guidelines, that's great. My thing is that, like, we've run in Jersey a bunch, but New York is home. And I yeah. feel like, especially with everything that's gone on, um, just in terms of the world, the climate we're in with, with COVID, with social unjust, uh, unrest and injustice, I think that we should return home. Like, yeah. it should be kind of grandiose, like this is where we need to be. Um, I think that's the most appropriate thing. So we're okay being on pause for right now because when we come back, we want to do it the way, the right way, the appropriate way in our style, you know, and our fan base is from New York. And, you know, there's a, there's a, pop, a population of them that aren't from Jersey, but I feel like, like, since this is home, this is where the comeback needs to happen. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Definitely. I know how it is when, you know, you have that home uh, company and, you know, what it means to that area for sure. Uh, we have a lot of that here in Jersey. Um, I know here in Jersey, um, I think, I, I want to say the governor, he probably, he cut, he cut it down back to like 25 people now. So I don't even know the challenges that we're going to be facing here now because of that, because I know it was up, but a lot of people were, were like having parties and stuff and, they're just making it bad for everybody. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very tough situation right now. Um, something that you kind of talked about and something that, you know, I, I like about you a lot um, with uh, like social injustice and trying to be diverse and inclusive of everyone. Um, I know you always, you make your voice heard on all of these issues for sure. And, um, you know, just, just, like, just talk about just creating that culture and, and uh, Battle Club Pro and just, like, like what was that mission of that and the importance of you wanting to uh, have inclusiveness as, you know, being a big part of your brand? Well, you know, like I said, it's, uh, I wanted to showcase what it is I saw growing up, what it is I knew, um, right. you know, witnessing things that shouldn't have happened, you know, seeing how people you know certain people are afforded um different opportunities simply because of who they are or maybe they're not afforded those opportunities because of who they are uh so when it comes to having that voice having that stance and wanting that you know inclusiveness in battle club it was it was pretty easy i mean you know in our infancy were we as inclusive were we as pro, you know, women, pro LGBT? Not necessarily, but again, that was in our infancy. I think we turned that around pretty quickly and we wanted to showcase, it, you know, to everyone who it is we are. Um, just on a personal level, like I couldn't, like I know I can't sit by and just kind of watch stuff like that happen and not at least speak up. That's the, that's the bare minimum anyone can do, you yeah. know, we're, I believe we're all the same, you know, um, and it's, you know, this thing goes back further than any of us could probably dare to imagine. Uh, and it's just not okay. It's not okay. There's no reason that because my family comes from a Spanish speaking country or because you might be a little darker than someone prefers that you shouldn't be afforded any opportunities. And it's, it's, it's just, it's always been dumb to me. I don't get it. The best person for the job, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, that should be the person to get the spot. Um, and that's what I want to focus on because it feels like for far too long, those people haven't been getting the opportunities. I mean, if you want to put it on like the biggest stage, like everyone, everyone know, everyone now knows it was not the right move for Triple H to go over Booker T at WrestleMania. Yeah. That was over a decade ago. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so yeah. like, and that's, that's just some, that's something that's recent. I said this on another podcast. Why is it that people like Butch Reed and Junkyard Dog um, weren't 
WWF, WWE champion. Why? Yeah. They they had it all. You know what I'm saying? For whatever reason, that's, you know, I'm not trying to bash anybody, but for whatever reason, that wasn't the case. So now I'm in a position where I can make it that. And that's what it's been. Tasha Steele's an Afro-Latina. She's our Archons champion. Anthony Bowens is our franchise champion. He's a, you know, openly gay, um, half black, half Italian model, athlete, activist. Like, that's who we want to showcase. The C-stars, you know, LGBT and uh, Latino, like, because that's, that's, that's what I know. Um, and does this mean that, you know, talent that might not necessarily be what I've uh, had growing up is going to not be showcased? Of course not. Matt McIntosh is a pillar of Battle Club Pro, and he's not, you know, he's, he's an Irish dude. <laughs> he likes to say he's from Boston for heat or whatever the case may be. from the, the yeah. English. But, like, you know, the whole point is if you are about it, if you're the best person for the position, you're going to get showcased. It's just that. I know what it is that I want um, and I know what it is that should be showcased. And I'm going to give those people that, that opportunity because uh, I was, uh, you know, back to another podcast I did, I was on with brotherly love and they were like, there's thousands of white run booked and operated uh, all white, you know, wrestling companies who don't showcase women who don't showcase people of colors. And it makes you stand out, which is it, in my mind, it's kind of weird because I think Battle Club Pro is just the microcosm of what New York is. And, and New York is is exactly that. Like, you know, you, whether you got LES, Williamsburg, Park Slopes, like that's what you see is people of color, people with different sexual orientations, people who identify as, you know, whether male, female, non-binary, binary, whatever the case may be. So, like, that's what I want to showcase. Yeah, no, um... I was going to say that too. I do think your Battle Club Pro represents like what New York is for sure. And the people that make up New York. Um, for you, did you find it, did you find it hard um, to kind of like stand up for these issues and, you know, sacrificing your business? Cause you know, for me, it was like, um, like in, in podcasting, um, you know, I'm African-American Um there's not a lot of African-American podcasters out there. There are some really good ones that are out there, but there's, there's a few of us who, you know, represent us. And um, I feel like sometimes you have to kind of think of, dang, me standing up for this, is this going to sacrifice fans listening to me or, you know, all this stuff. For me, I made the decision that it doesn't matter to me because at the end of the day, standing up for what I believe is right, standing up for my children, for what they're going to have to face in the future that was more important to me. Did you kind of have any of those thoughts or, or did that cross your mind at all? So here's the thing. And I've been very vocal. Like you could be conservative. You could be Republican. You can have your own opinion. You can have your own views. You can have your own rights. That's fine. That's yours. It's, you know, nine times out of 10, you're not going to change an adult's mind if they're not willing to change themselves. Yeah. Um, when you come to Battle Club, I want you to feel like it's home. I want you to feel like you're coming to grandma's house, you know, for a banging ass cookout. You want to be, I want you to feel safe and, and comfortable. Now, you know, I've said it, like, if you're making it a point to be racist, to be homophobic, you know, to just perpetuate the oppression that's going on in the world, I don't want your dollars. And while that might not be the most business savvy move what i will say is this you look at brands like nike reebok uh under armor adidas they've specialized in sports they're humongous because of sports what are the predominant athletes in said sports african-americans latinos yeah. so obviously if those multi-million dollar companies can back those kind of athletes and still be mainstream. Obviously they're doing something right, whether or not it's their legitimate political view or humanitarian view. That's another discussion to have. I just always, I just always known that like everyone wants to copy places like New York, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, and they tend to flow on the side of the urban, you know, the, 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 the hip hop, you know, rap, like they just, they just go towards that. Like people got to gear towards that. It's always been like that, you know, 
Um, so I, me, I think backing my people might not come off as a business savvy thing, but eventually it all works well and I bust my ass and I do everything I can to build this brand. People are going to jump on to support because that's the cool thing to do. Yeah, no, for sure. And, um, you know, for me personally, I, I always love when I see companies that, like you said, represent what I saw when I was growing up. And, you know, for for kids in, in urban areas like where we come from, it's good for them to see someone that looks like them actually succeeding in something that they love. So to be able to see those wrestlers on TV, to come to a Battle Club Pro show and see those wrestlers and, you know, ring announcers, refs, and, you know, just see a mix and pod diversity, it's, it, that's good for children as well, man. It is, it is outstanding for children. I work in education and the primary, the primary thing you have to do in education is build connection. And most people, you know, build connections immediately. That first impression is how you look. Now, if you don't look like me, I'm, hopefully the idea is that you give them a chance to see if we can connect through personality. But I think, especially with children, hey, that's a person. I see that, that person first. We're going to go and, and, and build from there. If I see that you look like my mom, my dad, my sisters, my brothers, Hey, I'm, I might be more inclined to to jump in, you know, head first and go from there. Um, is it always the case? Absolutely not. And and that's the wonderful thing about just life in general, the diversity. But like you said, like it, it's it's major to see someone who resembles me or resembles someone I knew growing up be super successful because then it becomes inspiring. Yeah, no, that that's definitely true. Um, so let's talk about that. How did how did you get into um? you know, working with kids and how did that career come about for you, man? Um, much like, much like pro wrestling, I just kind of fell into it and immediately fell in love with it. Yeah. Uh, I was managing a Radio Shack at the time uh, and uh, my sister had put uh, my niece and nephew in a charter school and like my, my sister's very involved. She's always, you know, on top of everything. So she overheard the, uh, the office talking about how they needed somebody um, and she kind of <laughs> butted in as, as she does, uh, to find out like what the position was or whatever. She got the info. She relayed it back to me. I, you know, I was, uh, I was actually set to open one of the flagship stores that Radio Shack was supposed mm -hmm. to be coming out within the city. And then I was, I, I did the interview for the school just, you know, just to do it. I always tell the kids like, say yes to every opportunity that comes up because you don't know where to lead. Like if you fail miserably, then you're back where you were if you would have said no, but at least you tried. Yeah. So I took the interview and they, they wanted to give me the job. So I called the district manager that day. I'm like, Hey, I'm out. He's like, what are you talking about? We're, we're about to toss you in on fifth Avenue or whatever. This multi-million dollar radio shack uh, store. Like, what are you talking about? You're done. I'm like, I'm done. You know, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have weekends off. I'm going to have summers off or, you know, summer with extra pay. Plus I get to, be in an environment that I feel like I can thrive in. I can actually make change instead of, you know, doing something to, and there's nothing wrong with being in sales. You do build connection in sales, but like the hope is to do and do something that will help inspire change. And, you know, if you get kids at the base level, when they grow up, the idea is that they're better humans and then you leave this world in a better place than you found it. So I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work in education. And I've, I haven't looked back and I loved it ever since. Yeah, man. Look at that. It, lo it looks like you made the, the, the better decision because right, right. Radio, Radio, Radio Shack's not even around no more. Right. You're right. So I've been <laughs> looking for a job and it's crazy. And then, like I, I did, I made the right call and I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. To, um, do you ever um like uh, collide those worlds and, um, like, um, I'm pretty sure you, to keep kids in line, like you could use wrestling as a, a persuasive tool or a way, you know, that's how kids are, man. We, 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 we always got to bribe them, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, there, there are a few students who love the fact that I'm involved in wrestling. Uh, it blows their mind um, when I tell them, when they'll ask me, hey, have you ever worked with this person or that person? I'll be like, yeah, look, and then I'll show a picture. Um, the best reaction I, I think I ever got was, um, there's this kid named Raymond where I work and he didn't believe 
He didn't believe. Like I showed him tons of pictures. He was like, no, 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 this is this not real, whatever. He's like, he just didn't believe. And he was huge, huge, huge LAX fan and specifically loved Diamante. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, and then I went to film a Wrestle Pro show and she was there. So I was like, hey, like I'm, it was the first time I'm meeting her, but I was like, hey, like I've got a student who's kind of on the fence when it comes to like schoolwork and behavior. If you could just do a quick video and, you know, tell him, hey, how you doing? Keep it up in school. I think it'll work. And it did. Like he just, I called him into the office. He thought he was in trouble. Um, and I showed him a video of Diamante, you know, shouting him out. And he just like, he almost cried there. Just, he was floored. He hadn't, he just didn't believe it. Uh, and I actually recorded that reaction and I, I sent it to her and, and, her, and I, you know, conversely her and I have been really tight ever since. Um, and he's been, for the most part, he's been a really good student since. Yeah. Oh, see, that's great, man. It's good. It's good when you could, you know, that's kind of like what we said, just showing, you know, kids in those urban areas, like, you know, that there's people out there like you and, you know, and they care about you too on top of it. They want you to succeed too on top of it. Um, you know, just talking about Diamante and uh, I know somebody else um, that, you know, you were pretty tight with Mia Yim as well. And, you know, what she's done for Battle Club Pro. Um, how do you, how, how excited are you? Like Mia Yim, the last time we talked, um, I think she was in the, um, it was the, the, the tournament, the, the May Young tournament, I want to say it was. Um, yeah. And uh, then now uh, Diamante, she was just on AEW. Uh, on Wednesday, like, how does that, how does that feel? You see those, those wrestlers that, you know, that have come through Battle Club Pro's doors and now, you know, they're on TV and they're making it. It's, it's wonderful. It's absolutely amazing. Um, we'll never, Battle Club will never take credit for putting anyone on the map. Yeah. All we are is, is a stepping stone for those wrestlers to get to where they need to be. And it's a privilege and an honor for us to work with them to get them there. Um, you know, but you know, the athletes, they do all the hard work, they train, they bust their ass, they, they make the drive, they take the flights. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's wonderful to see someone that you genuinely know is a good person. Um, I've, I've said this a lot, like there are pillars in battle club, you know, Bowens, Carter, McIntosh, Federated, you know, Harlow, Tasha, um, Savannah Evans, like there's just people that are like there and they're going to be there up until it's their time to leave. Um, but it's, it's rewarding because you, you know, these people are just genuinely good down to earth people who want nothing more to succeed. And when you can see them, like watching Tasha on impact, kill it is amazing. Yeah. Watching yeah. Diamante on AW kill it. It's amazing. Mia Yim is on NXT. It's like, I just, I remember I was in a, we, I was hanging out with, uh, the gift god, Hokai, and we were, like, driving, and she was on TV, so, like, he put it on his phone, so now, like, I'm driving, we're driving through the Bronx, and we're watching her match on on our, on the, on his phone, just to be, like, supportive of her, and yeah. immediately after, we, like, sent her messages or whatever, and, you know, it was, it's just, it's just wonderful, because wrestling's always evolving, you know, people are coming, people are going, um, but you know, our mission holds true is like, all we want to do is help showcase talent to the point where they could get that major contract. And it is very rewarding to see that happening. And, you know, we still got a lot of work to do. Um, but yeah, me and is personally one of, one of my favorites, you know, I've, I've gone on record as saying like me, Yim, LAX, Diamante, like they've done a lot because they had this following beforehand that before we ever you know were a thing and they decided to come and help us out and it it, it did help propel us you know the same with with uh, the current WWE champion is drew mcintyre he didn't have to come work for battle club in the bronx he didn't but he did yeah. you know he defended the wcpw title which was great against bowens that was that was just awesome he didn't have to but he did and not only did he do that he was really nice about it. he was kind he 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 helped, like, if anyone asked him for five or ten minutes just to talk, you know, he gave his honest opinion about everything. Um, you know, was so down to earth, decided to take a picture with our shirt on just to help us, you know, again, use the following that he had already maintained. And that's the whole thing is to give back. And, and it just, it's wonderful. It's rewarding. It's feeding that ecosystem so that it can continue to feed others who are coming up on their own. 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you guys at, at Battle Club Pro, um, you know, I like to say, because I know last time we talked, you were doing the, uh, the all-woman show um, for Battle Club Pro. And it's like you guys and even like a lot of other independent companies like are ahead of the curve when it comes to the way like society is evolving in general. Um, you can see now like AEW, like they have great talent, like Sonny Kiss. Like we here in, in the Tri-State area, we knew Sonny Kiss was amazing already. Um, you know, just Anthony Bowen and stuff like that and Nyla Rose uh, and, you know, just, just things like that and, and just featuring women more. Um, you know, I know you probably won't take credit for it, but you know, people like us, we, we like to give you guys credit because the Indies, the Indies is where a lot of things are created and a lot of the big guys, they take from, from the Indies, man. And to create, do you ever feel like that? Like the, the big guys, they're kind of slow when it comes to, you know, evolving and doing the things they need to do. So what I think happens is there's a formula for success. Mm -hmm. and the more successful that formula is, the harder it is to get away from it. Yeah. Um, when you're striving to succeed, you can fiddle with your formula to try to make it as successful as possible. So that's why it's always, pro it's always easier on the indies to do different things because the, the roof only gets so much higher the more you succeed. Um, and then once you find that like thing, that's going to make you totally successful. If you want to take that opportunity to try to do something totally different to see if it'll still work, you can. But I think a lot of people are just not scared. They just, they're more reserved when it comes to trying to do things differently. Um, I think with, I think with AEW, um, and WWE, they might not necessarily be slow i just think it's more about when they can be most opportunistic to do those kind of things whereas like a company like impact has always made it a very very focal point to like emphasize how important their knockouts are mm -hmm. yeah. um and i think you know the knockouts division has been probably the top women's division for a while it might not be the top now but like they made it a point to focus on them and you see now it's the the bigger brands are doing such of uh, doing so. Um, I just think it's, it's, if you know, something works, it's harder to get away from it. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. uh, to make it a sports reference, like Lonzo ball has a disgusting shot, but it works. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard to tell him to change that if it works. Now, can he tinker with it a little bit? Maybe his release could be faster. Maybe he could, pick the ball up a little higher so his release isn't as long. Maybe he can jump a little higher. Like, you can do things to tinker with it, but you don't want to totally change what you're doing unless you know for a fact it can be completely successful. Yeah, no, that, that, that definitely uh, – that makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, you know, when it comes to, to Battle Club Pro, um, what do you do personally to kind of differentiate yourself from, like, everybody else that's around us. Cause we know this area is saturated. There's wrestling companies popping up every other day out here. <laughs> what, what, what is, you know, battle club do to, to say, Hey, we're not like these other guys and you should come watch our shows. Um, I guess I'm not, I've never really been, I'm only going to say I, we've never been afraid to showcase talent that might not be familiar. Um, I just want, like, Ruby Rays uh, was on the first WCW show. Now, she's well-known on the West Coast, but maybe not so familiar over here. And it was it was a pleasure to have her here, to have her, you know, work with us. Um, I think it's just a bit of wanting to try to be outside the box in terms of talent. There's but so much you could do if you don't have the budget to make these exponential, like, production decisions. Yeah. So you've got to try to focus on what you can do. And what you can do is maybe book different talent, book different types of matches. Um, lately, it's been more of a focus on, hey, there should be equal, if not more women on the card than men. Um, the 
you know, the LGBT community should have as much representation as possible all throughout the card. And, but it's at the same time, it's also not just putting them there because that's who they are as people. Like, do they fit the brand? Do they work? Do they have the, the, the specific level of work that sh we should be showcasing? And I think we've, you know, we found a really good space to, to be in. Um, never, you know, afraid to try different things. Like I, I put, I put it, uh, Joe Gacy in a match with Trip Cassidy and I saw them and my mind melted because I'm like, man, they'd be a great tag team. And lo and behold, like that that happened at the beginning of the year. The end of the year they were I had them do a tag team spot and it was it was incredible. It's yeah. it's it's about I think what we do well is never we're never afraid to kind of just do something different. And you know, it's like that that old saying where you you throw sun against the wall and see if it sticks. Um yeah. I think a lot of the companies in the tri state um, do their best to do the same thing. Um, and I'm, again, not trying to knock anyone, but it's like, like I said, like, I've always tried to make it a point to, for the fans, for the staff, for the sponsors, for the workers, you come to a battle club show, you feel safe. And once you know you're chill and it's safe and it's cool and you got nothing to worry about, you, you can be relaxed and you can let your guard down. That's when true fun happens. And I think that we're keeping that along with being different enough so that those two things kind of, you know, melts together and you just feel like, hey, this is somewhere I want to be continuously and going forward. Yeah, no, definitely for sure. And I think you're, you're doing a good job at, you know, providing that to, to your fans. You. Um, you know, being in New York, I, I got I to gotta talk about rap music. This is the Rap and Wrestle podcast. Yeah. Um, you know what 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 hip hop are you listening to nowadays? Nowadays, um, he's like, what hip hop? There's no hip hop. <laughs> you know what it is? It's it's just it's different, and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with being different. Yeah, if yeah. These artists are you know they're making these hits, whether it's one hit wonder or whether it's something that might not necessarily connect with an older older generation, but they're getting their YouTube views, they're getting their record deals their record sales, they're getting plays on places like Spotify, Pandora. If it's working for them, that's great. Um, yeah. I've always been someone who who needs substance in mm -hmm. the kind of music that I listen to. So I've always had an affinity for like Tupac. Um, yeah. You know, Biggie was more of the party rapper, but he's had his moments like, I mean... <laughs> God, it, 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 I know the song because it's like I'm from Best Style. I feel like I'm selling out. Uh, but he was like, uh, uh, dedicated to all the teachers that said I wouldn't amount to anything. Yeah. I was just, Juicy. you know, trying to sell drugs to feed my daughter. Like, that's yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah that's, that's Juicy. Weird. That's what I see. You're juicy. There you go. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. why can't I fucking remember it? Um, but uh, yeah, like, I need substance. Um, and I'm not saying that's not what rappers nowadays have because there are. Kendrick Lamar, uh, Lucas Joyner, uh, yeah. uh, King Cole, they're there. It's just the party scene is the mainstream scene. Yeah. And it takes it takes some of those partiers to kind of recognize maybe substance in what's being said is more important for that to change. Yeah, because true. that's is what happened in the eighties. In the eighties, it was pop lock. It was all about dancing um, and hip hop was partying. And then, and, and then you, you, the NWA comes and then it's like, shit, this is really happening in real life. Mm -hmm. they, let, let's pay attention to that. And then from the late eighties, all the way through until like the early two thousands ish, you had rappers that have substance and those are the rappers that people listen to. Yeah. Um, you know, this Tupac had a quote where it was like, I'm not going to change the world, but I'm going to influence the mind that does. So yeah, that's true. kind of in the position we are now. Like, yeah, party, party, party rap, mumble rap, whatever you want to call it. That's the thing. But, you know, these guys that are chipping away, you know, uh, Cole having albums with no features, you know, uh, um, that, that uh, the racial divide song that Lucas Joyner had, you know, the two different perspectives, like things like that, you keep chipping away eventually enough people we're partying are going to listen to that 
and realize that's what we should be listening to because that is not only something that is actually going on, but it opens our cognitive, uh, our cognitive minds up to realize, well, the only way to recognize, the only way to change something is to recognize what's wrong with it first. Yeah, and sure. I think that's what's going on with all the social injustice in the world right now. It's like so many years of seeing all this nonsense going on. You recognize there's a problem, and now it's it's being you know now it's now the fight is actually being fought, and yeah. you know you got to keep your pet you know your foot to the pedal and keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. You know, all the hashtags they matter. You just don't want anyone to become a hashtag. I I would, you know, so you fight so that that doesn't happen anymore. You know, I can't breathe. Who would have thought five, six years ago when that happened to Eric Garner, that five or six years later, we'd be using the same phrase for a different black man as his last words for a reason for police brutality to stop. You know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, this is, again, a recency. This is five years. These things have been going on forever, for for far longer than anyone should ever realize it. You know, hopefully the goal is that, along with music and entertainment, uh, pro sports, uh, wrestling, that in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, when those children are growing up, they don't know what racism is. They don't know what excessive force is. They don't know what, you know, civil unrest is because things should have gotten to a point where there finally is true equality. Yeah, no, definitely. And, um, you know, I think a, a lot of with, with music, especially when it comes to children, um, it's so easy for, like, children to remember lyrics to a song as opposed to, like, learning schoolwork or something because it's something they're interested in. They want to learn it. They want to know the lyrics. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, a lot of times, I don't, I don't think a lot of these guys realize like the influence that they actually have on a lot of people and they may not, you know, think of it like that. And it, it's a lot easier to influence people nowadays because we all got free social media. We all could, you know, they didn't have that back in the days. It was only a certain amount of people, you know, to get your stuff on the radio, Hot 97, you know, things like that. And, you know, now it's like you could, you could broadcast to the world. Um, like with the music nowadays, um, though, I don't, um, I don't look at it in a, in a, in a bad way either, kind of like you, the same way. Because the same way we, we got our hip-hop, our parents looked at our hip-hop the same way. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're like, what is this right. crap? You know, you know, so, and I, and I kind of like that. We're, we're kind of in that middle divide of where we're, like, in the middle of that generation and this generation. So, you know, you can still kind of listen. Sometimes, you know, you want to party. You want to just enjoy right. whatever. You still, you know. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, I, I let the young kids do their thing, man. Right. right. There's nothing, there is absolutely nothing wrong with these artists making their money, their worth, their wealth, and yeah. having their kids and their kids, you know, afterwards being taken care of. It's just, I've always had this saying where it's like, I don't understand how racism exists because, like, the only color that matters in this country is green. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's, it's like, it, it's good and bad in the sense that if you have it and then you're doing everything you can with it to help, then it's infinitely good. But do you know, the problem is do you get, to, you end up having so many people that have it and that's all they care about and they don't care what you look like. They'll sell you out in order to keep it. You know, that's the wealthy elite or whatever it is you want to call it. And mm-hmm. it's, it's unfortunate that, that stuff like that, you know, it, it affects the minds of these, these artists. Like they are like, all, all they want to do is all I care about is money. I don't care who buy my records. I don't care what it is I'm doing. And it, it shouldn't be that way. If you were, if you've earned a platform and you knew you came up from a position of oppression, it doesn't take much to help out. You know, even if it's, it's something is, you know, people like to nitpick or like, Oh, well, he only had one woke or conscious song but at least he did something, you know, he, she, or whatever, like, and that should be, that's what I've always advocated for. And going in the opposite direction, like, you know, going all the way back to that early question you said, like, you can have a difference of opinion. I don't think there's a such thing as a difference of opinion on basic human rights, but if you don't agree with something, 
that's fine. Where you mess up is where you stop, where you don't tolerate it. You know, the moment you become discriminatory against mm-hmm. the thing you have a difference of opinion on, then you're wrong. Yeah. Because if it's not directly affecting you, what does it matter? True. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So, you know, to tie this whole thing together is like, yes, today's music not, might not necessarily connect with the generation in their 30s and 40s, but that generation that's under us, like those artists specifically, maybe, you know, maybe tune it up a bit because as you get older and you have kids, you start to see shit, partying is not the only thing that's important in life. Yeah. And no. you would want that world to be better than you left it, than you then you found it. So, you know, make make all your money, all of them, the, the 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 nonsense, the colorful music, the saying the same hook seven hundred thousand times and only literally having one verse. That's fine, but do something productive with what you got because you want things better. You should want things better at least. Yeah, no, definitely use your platform for sure. If you if you got it, I definitely think you should definitely use it. Um, you know, when it comes to New York, um, I feel like when especially in music, like New York is like the uh is like the core of the music industry. It's where a lot of great talent comes from. Um, a lot of creativity is uh mimicked from New York. Um, the great debate, who do you think is the best rapper to ever come out of New York? I know that's a tough Ooh. one. <laughs> that's a tough one. Woo! Good lord, that's a <laughs> <laughs> all right give me your top give me your top three how about that give me your top three I, all right so okay so we'll do i'll do i'll do my top three i'm not saying this is the top three i'll do my okay. top three fair enough from new york uh i the first two are pretty obvious Nas and jay-z okay um, gotcha, that one. now the third one like i said i i've always i was a I was a bigger Tupac fan than I was a Biggie fan. It's just like mm-hmm. Tupac, while he, like Biggie had a bigger, better flow. It was more party vibes. It was, it was more happy and uplifting. And like, you know, that was the chill music. That was the music of the time. Like with the things Tupac would say, whether he was angry, whether he was, you know, empathetic, whether he was, you know, just trying to tell a story, like it connected with me. So mm-hmm. I was a, you know, bigger Tupac fan. But, you know, you could put Biggie in that third slot. You could, you know, if I wanted to be an oddball, um, you know, Big L's time was cut way short. Yeah, for um, sure. Um, I love I love the way the uh, uh, Joel Ortiz cadence. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. f- uh, big pun. Like, it's just, it's too hard to mm-hmm. specify. But um, it's just... I mean, you you pretty much can't go wrong with just about anyone, but I I'm gonna go with I'll go with Jay, um, because now he's like he's in a position where he can affect change in in the neighborhoods he's been in and he's tried. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nas again, just very just conscious and 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 always just spit. It felt like he spit from the heart. Never really got into. Um, okay, top three from New York that are still living. Like, uh, <laughs> Dude, Joel Santana is another one. It's just, I'll, I'll go with Joel Ortiz just because he's hysterical. That's good. No, Joel Ortiz, this, this you got bars, man. Top three. This is you my got- top three that if I'm – taking a long road trip like those three artists would definitely be on the ipod going or whatever the case may be oh see that's dope that's dope i'll give, I'll give you that it's, it's that's a hard question to it's so to hard ask anybody <laughs> that's like asking somebody in new york what's the best pizza man that's, 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 a, that's a hard I, i'll tell you my personal favorite <laughs> yeah, what's my that personal favorite is, is joe's on on uh right off of carmine i'm not off uh yeah it's carmine street yeah right yeah. there um in the city, I mean, that, that fresh mozz fucking slices, woo, love yeah, it. I got, I gotta try that. See, we got Jersey. Jersey got good pizza too. That's always Jersey, that's the Jersey best pizza, pizza in the world. Jersey in New York, man. I don't, know, I don't know about best pizza in the world, cause you know what? I got put onto pizza in New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. I never, yo, I'm telling you, 
I went, I was like, oh my God, this is so much better than anyone's given it credit to. But Jersey's pizza is underrated because it's like everyone just thinks New York. Like, Jersey has some du- bomb pizza. It does. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, it's a weird, it's a weird, like, bias thing. Like, if you're from New York, you just don't like Jersey. If you're from Jersey, you don't like New York. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Weird. Like, how. And that's, and that's, again, that's a deeper conversation in terms of conditioning. Like, we're literally separated by these invisible lines. We shouldn't be hating anybody. True. Facts on that. Facts on that. That's funny. Someone, um, I, I posted a meme, like, a couple of weeks back, and it was, like, um, the top five pizzas in the world. And it was, like, New York, New Jersey, the rest doesn't matter. <laughs> then, that's what, that's not, <laughs> if you ever find yourself in, in New Haven, Connecticut, man, um, Sally's, um, um, Pepe's, Frank Pepe's. Like, there's a, there's a, there's some good yeah. pizza in Connecticut. I was like stunned. I was like, oh my goodness, this is super quality. Yeah. So, you know, one of my friends, she's, she, uh, went to school in Connecticut and she actually responded back and she was like, she was like, I'm telling you, the best pizzas in Connecticut. She was like, you got to come with me out there. I was like, Connecticut, what? I was like, are you serious? It's, it's Connecticut? Wild. And, and, the, and the, here's this, this is the thing, like, you can never really tell because the best time to eat a slice, if it's once it's fresh cooked and you get yeah. it, you get it cut from a fresh pie yeah. and then you eat it. But how in the world are we going to get a pizza from Jersey, New York and Connecticut in the same place at the same time to actually tell? True. You, know? That's right. because you could be having a bad day and you, you go and try Joe's and you're like, all right, well, it's subpar. And then a month later, you know, you're on a date with a, a beautiful person. And they're like, hey, they swear by Joe's. And you're like, well, I had it. I didn't really like it. Then you have it again. You're like, yo, this is so much better. The yeah. company you keep, like, the atmosphere, everything can affect your taste buds for that that moment. So, like, we'll never actually know what the best is because you can never actually try all three and under the same conditions. True. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll give you credit on that one. I'll give you credit on that one. Um uh, when you were talking about Nas, uh, kind of jump back. We started talking about pizza. See, <laughs> Nas. Um, one thing I I love Nas because Nas is, is like real, and people people always gave him a lot of a slack because uh, you know he would he would try to kick knowledge to you, and then he had you know Uchi Wali Wali. And for me, that was like it just showed like yo, I'm a real person. It's like yeah, I I love these things. And at the same time, I want to still school you and teach you to do better. You know what I mean? Uh, what, what's your thoughts on like on like that? It it shows it's it's a baseball term. It's called range. If you're yeah. playing short, you could still pl- you could cover third base or second base, and mm-hmm. still you filled your position. That's all Nas had was range. He could party it up. You know, with Wally, the summer that song came on, like that's all you heard. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But then you yep. go hooking around and and it, uh I know I can like he'll drop something like that and it's like mm-hmm. that that's all it is. And that's all again, that's a reflection of just the human, the actual human condition. No human, anyone, anywhere is just one single solitary thing. Yeah. You know? Uh, an extreme example, and, and I'm not advocating for any of this, but an extreme example is do you necessarily think that Hitler's family saw him as the villain the rest of the world did? Right, yeah. not, advocate, not advocating at all for Nazis, just an extreme example. You know, some, you know, people will always be the bad guy in someone else's book. Yeah. You just don't know whose book that is. Uh, you don't know who's going to tell your story. They could tell your story and it could be what, you know, the majority thinks is that it was, this was a great person. And then you'll, you'll always find that other person who's like, well, you know what? kind of kind of because he was kind of an asshole to me and they're like really i've never gotten that but you're like you just you never know you just go on living your life as best as you can but all Nas ever did was just show the range he had you know and then again in line with tupac again with j cole as, as much as you know he had the, he dropped that song uh, where he he talking about letting Nas down yeah because the first hit was a party hit and it was it just didn't show at all what he actually could do Mm-hmm. But again, yeah. that range, like his, again, in his infancy, when it came to mainstream rap, he dropped the party song, but he realized that's not who he necessarily was. That shows growth. That shows character. That's all people, you know, all people have that same thing. You could be, you know, you could be a, a functional pothead. All you do is smoke, smoke all the time. 
Mm-hmm. Someone sits you aside and tries to clown on you, and then you sit there and you hit them with every medical reason why smoking pot is a good thing to do. They're going to be dumbfounded, and you're going to look like a rogue scholar. Yeah, <laughs> facts. <laughs> It's range. That's that's all people like that. Now, some people have more range than others. It also depends on what it is you're talking about. You know, the, you you can't you can't judge a fish's intelligence when it comes. You know, if they're going to try to climb a tree, because that's not going to happen. Yeah. So you're going to think that the fi- is the fish an idiot because it can't climb a tree? No, yeah. that's not what it's designed to do. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, I totally agree. Ra- you know, Nas's range always got kind of he always kind of got shitted on for it. But it just it just showed that that's who he is as a person. Yeah, I, I always just I always just hated that perception of like you can't you if you if you're going to kick knowledge you got to be one right. certain type of person and it's like you don't have to be that type of person you can still like women and right. still try to teach somebody then, something at the same time. Those, what I've come across is a lot of those people are Jay Z fans and that's fine to be a Jay Z fan, sure. but you know he was dropping party hits with Foxy Brown. You yeah. know what I'm saying? He's doing the Early. same thing. He's doing the right. same and, exact and thing. Then, and then, but you didn't think the dude that was like doing the party records with, with Foxy Brown or, you know, whoever, he, whatever else he was doing was going to turn around and become a, an assassin with TakeOver. You yeah. didn't, that didn't come to your head. There's no way you thought that was going to happen. Yeah. But he dropped TakeOver, you're like, oh, my lord. He just mm-hmm. murked Nas. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, like, again, he showed range too, but it, you know what it is, is that, again, the only important, the only color that's actually important in this country is green. So when when the debate came, who's the better rapper, I feel like everyone who's a Jay-Z fan defaults to, like, who sold more records. Yeah. Jay did. Yep. Yep. And that doesn't necessarily mean he's a better rapper. It just means he sold more records. But that was, you know, it's the same thing with, the the Yankee, if you're arguing with a Yankee fan, no matter what team you're you're for, they're always gonna go, Well, who has more championships? That's what I do. The Yankees you're right. do. <laughs> you're right, I do that. And then when you, 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 you my my me being a sarcastic asshole, I'm a, I like to say, well, they won eighteen championships before full integration. So they really only have nine championships. <laughs> yeah. Because if you win eighteen championships while the brothers and the Latinos are on the side, and they're the predominant athletes in the sport. Yeah. Really win those 18 championships. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I digress. That's funny. That's funny. You should, you should, championships shouldn't count unless you actually saw your team win those championships. You can't be mentioning yeah, all those championships. Win, win, win. <laughs> I give you that. So uh, I know, uh, I know uh, you're a big figure guy too, right? When it comes to collecting the figures, I had I was for a while, man. I still I have I had to put them away, dude. They, I, I kid you not. Like I don't even know how I I got dates or, or got girls to go out with me because at <laughs> one time my room looked like a toy store. It was oh, ridiculous. Man. Crazy, um, crazy. So I had to put them away because I I had to stop it, man. I had to stop it. I still have I have a ton of figures. And I've slowly been selling them off to people who've really been interested. Um, and it kind of hurts a bit. And literally, like, it's wild because I'll never forget it. It all started like, like I just, a, a random date. We went into a store in the city and this was punk leaving. This was post-punk leaving. And mm-hmm. I was like, it was the first CM Punk toy I saw in years. You know, he yeah. left in, what, he left in 2014, right? Yep. So it was like... 20 it might have been a, like a year and a half and i saw that cm punk figure and i was like i gotta get it it's the first one i've seen in a long long time uh-huh. and it snowballed from there it went from one punk to nine punks to oh, 18 man. punks and i was like well i got this punk i gotta get the taker to match that wrestlemania match oh man i gotta get that brock though and and then before i know it i had 150 figures just all over everywhere and and i couldn't I could not believe that that happened. Um, I do love the figures, and and I know that there's some figures coming out soon that I'm definitely going to buy. I saw the mock-up for the Mia Yim figure. I have to get that. Um, that's going to be one that will never leave the collect- collection. Um, but, yeah, man, because it, you know what? It's it's like a video game. Like, could you imagine being in history, like having your image forever? In history? And with today's digital age, like, it'll be forever. Yeah. It won't be like 
the you know 1600s where you have to find someone who will draw you once yeah. you're in a video game you're in the video game forever backwards compatibility would make that game playable forever yep so that's dope and it's the same thing with figures like with, with social media like you said we have all this access to information once you have that figure made it will always be accessible you your your legacy that'll all be always be tied to your legacy so like it's it's so cool man i, I love them and they've gotten so much better like when i was growing up you know, they were the little, the little tiny ones that that, yep. that did like did one move. motion or whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> then you know, they went to Jacks and they were rubbery. They were more lifelike, but they still weren't great. Yeah. Uh, and now, like Mattel is just taking it to a whole different level. They've done things with McFarlane where it's like you can't even believe the detail on those figures. Yep. It's great. It's great. It's great. You see, you, you're, you're trying to wake that collector out of me, and I was like, no, I need these guys to go to Battle Club. No more yeah. toys. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. Everybody has their thing that's a wrestling fan that they collect or whatever. My boy Andrew has, like, a gazillion autographs. I know Shane Fair is into autographs as well. Yeah. Um, me, I'm the same way as you, man. Figures. I, I'm, like, at probably, like, 45 go, going oh, to 50 man. now. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm right behind you. And for me, oh, my goodness, when Toys R Us went out of business, I was getting the elite figures for, like, $8, man. Racking so, up, right? <laughs> it was crazy. So I, I was spending money like, like, like yeah. it was, it was nuts, man. The way I was spending money on those figures, man. Um, but all right. So wrapping up, man. Just so fans, they can, um, how they can stay connected with you, how they can stay connected with Battle Club Pro, and you know, find out about all your events coming up. I mean, social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook forward slash Battle Club Pro. Um, Twitter and Instagram is X Battle Club Pro. Again, we're on pause and we're okay being on pause because I, I just who I am, just who my team is. We couldn't risk anyone's health. Like I yeah. said, like if there's a way to do something and I know it's safe, we will. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that it's in New York because with all these trying times, we we really want to bring that home because that's where it deserves to be. Mm -hmm. Um we might be coming out with some content. Um, I'm not going to say anything quite yet, but there might be some content on that Battle Club Pro YouTube page um, in talks with Title Match to maybe get this content out on, a, on their streaming service to go further out. But, you know, slowly as the world opens back up, the presence will pick back up. Um, we're not going anywhere. You know, that's just the case. You know, that's not the case. We're not going anywhere. We're just, we realize that, Right now, people's lives and people's health is more important than putting on wrestling shows. Um, and we're all, the management team, the ownership team, we're all in a position where we're fortunate enough to not need to do wrestling in order to survive. Um, yeah. And it's a, it is a blessing. Um, uh, so we'll just be on the, you know, we're laying low for that right now, but, you know, things are coming. Um, I know that my partner, Ray Red, he's been working tirelessly to try to re-up and revamp the whole merchandise scene. And I think that's going to be dropping soon. I think we'll have a legitimate link where you can buy Battle Club gear and then we'll tie it in. It's like, hey, if you can, you know, do orders and we do, we do shows, you know, it could be discounted or you can be entered in raffles or whatever the case may be. Yeah, but, yeah. Our thing is that, you know, there's content, all of our stuff's on title match. We have stuff on YouTube, you know, we're, you know, we're not as active on social media as we should be because again, the voice is needed for other things, but we're there, you know, we try, we thank fans, if ever they retweet our stuff, if ever they interact. And that's just the way it is right now. So right now, just laying low, but we will be back in full effect. And when we are, it's going to be just, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, no, I, I can't. I'll put my money on it for sure. Uh, definitely can't wait for that. And, uh, you know, when things kind of get back to normal, you guys are running your shows, I'll, I'll make my way up to New York, man, and kind of I'll come check you out, bro. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Just let me know, man. Just let me know. Definitely. And uh, definitely make sure you check out Battle Club Pro. Uh, great company, inclusive, diverse, great talent. I don't know what more you can want from a company right there. Um, and Joe, uh, just I thank you for you know taking the time out, making this work for me, man. And you know, uh, I appreciate it. And then hopefully in the future, man, 
I'll work something out. I'll get you back on, man, so we can do something oh, else. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm always down. Like I said, if, if any of you guys are scraping the bottom of the the, the guest barrel, I'm always down. <laughs> so, you know, nah, so. nah, nah, you're at the top of the barrel, bro. You're at the top of <laughs> but it, it. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I, I love, you know, anytime someone takes something into their own position and tries to run with it, Rap and wrestle makes so much sense in the world. You know, they had the rock and wrestling connection in the 80s. So, yeah. like, obviously, it's just a natural transition. So, you know, man, keep keep going for it, man. Uh, it's, a, it's a good platform. You know, whatever you can do to tie it in together, you know, yeah. more so, then definitely do it, man, and keep keep pushing. Yeah, definitely, man. I definitely uh, I appreciate that for sure. Um, and, you know, as for us, you know, rap and wrestle – on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode and watching it. YouTube, iTunes, uh, just type in Rap and Wrestle. Uh, follow us, Instagram, Twitter. Stay up to date with everything. And for this episode, we are out.